Testing. Can you guys hear me now? All right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, feels kind of awkward. I have to go through that whole spiel again. <laughs> But um, yep, sorry about that. I checked the settings and apparently uh, it wasn't set onto my microphone for the setup, so it wasn't providing sound. So here we go again. Um, <laughs> welcome to our option seminar course for X Trades. Uh, this is a free seminar and it's going to be about covered calls today. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't heard about X Trades before, you know, come come and join us. Uh, it's a it's great chat room. We provide alerts and signals, and but we mostly focus on ed providing education and uh, basically improving our strategies uh, as traders. And so, uh, you know, for anybody who's new to X Trades, we do have a free trial, so come check us out. And let's see, uh, for this particular seminar, we're going to be going over covered calls. And so, last time we did go over. ER calendar spreads as well as some option basics. So I'm going to go into this particular seminar with the assumption uh, that you do have that basic knowledge of, you know, what are option Greeks, um, what are options, et cetera. If, if you're not so familiar with that, uh, I'll try to answer some questions as we go through, but I'm sure there's a few helpful folks in the chat who can also help you with that. Um, but otherwise, you know, go check out that previous video from two weeks ago, it was on February 6th, so that was on a Saturday as well. Um, and we went over options basics as well as the ER calendar spreads uh, that time. So that is available. I think Twitch is expiring that video today, uh, but I will be uploading that video elsewhere, probably to our YouTube channel. And uh, I'll also be uploading the slides for today's seminar as well as uh, last session's um, slides on our Discord channel. So so definitely go check that out if you are not already a member. And just, you know, brief introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to go through these as quickly as possible. Um, I, I'm Timehawk again. Uh, I'm an analyst with X Trades. Been trading for about seven years, mostly focusing on swing trading. And I do do some scalps and day trades. This particular month, I've been focusing more on alerting uh, in the chat um, ER calendar spreads. And that's just because that's what we were talking about in our last seminar. So I wanted to give more examples of how to do it and how to use it uh, to our chat. And that's why most of my alerts this month have been uh, ER related. But mostly for my own personal trading, uh, I mostly focus on swing trading and I have a few different accounts. Some of those accounts are dedicated to these um, particular strategies that we talk about in these seminars. Okay. Uh, and then we will generally um, focus more on just going through the lesson plan or the seminar as we go through the slides. And I'll try to answer questions as we go along, of course. Feel free to ask those questions. Uh, and then we'll focus more on practical aspects or actual examples uh, towards the end of the seminar. So theory first and then application. Uh, and so that's the general layout for this course. All right, uh, so today's contents or what we're gonna talk about today um, oh, and, and before I forget, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but I was muted. E everything and <laughs> on this uh, stream is basically for educational purposes. Nothing constitutes, you know, a buy or sell, uh, you know, recommendation. Um, it is just my own opinion. Uh, I do think that these strategies are great to take advantage of, to build your toolkit, to make you a more successful trader. And, you know, results are conditional on the markets, right? Uh, but, you know, I do, I do have good success with these strategies, and I'll share you with you what I know about them. Um, so that's just my little disclaimer blurb there. Uh, so today's contents, you know, what are income strategies? Um, so some of those are going to be things that we talked about last time, and uh, as well as a new topic today, which is going to be the covered calls. 
I'm also going to do a brief recap of the previous seminar on the ER calendar spread strat, um, just because I had a lot of questions about it and a lot of people still aren't really sure uh, how to utilize them. So I just wanted to share some additional thoughts about it uh, after I've received some questions on it. So those are the things that we'll be going over today, and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, estimated time for this seminar is probably going to be about an hour to an hour and a half. Um, I was thinking about that last time too, and then the stream ended up being three hours. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but this time I'm going to try to stick with my guidelines uh, on time here. And uh, as for rewatching, uh, thanks, Young Bull, for answering that. Um, but for Twitch, uh, since we are a higher tier, we do get 14 days. Uh, we are applying for a partnership, so hopefully we can get that extended longer. But yeah, we'll be trying to upload to the YouTube channel. All right, so uh, these are just the definitions. I left these in the slides from last time, uh, just in case that some people might not be familiar with, with you know, the terminology. I'm not going to be going over these definitions this time. I'm going to assume you already know these. Um, but they're here for you if you need to see them. All the definitions. All right. So what are options, income strategies? So option income strategies, you know, they mostly include selling or in other words, writing options, right? This is as opposed to buying options where we are essentially, you know, betting that a stock is going to go up, down, sideways, whatever, right? For income strategies, it's more focused on um, less risk, higher chance of success, to provide a steady stream of income. So that's why it's called an income strategy, right? Uh, and the key factor is the one thing that is always constant with options, the one thing that we know is always there, and that's data, right? Um, so for data, for those of you who aren't familiar with what data is, it's the decay of options premiums um, over time. So the T in data stands for time. Pretty simple, straightforward there. If uh, you know you come from a science background or math background, then you're probably already familiar with data. Um, but yep, it's just one of the Greeks for options. And the one constant we have is time. Time is always moving forward, right? Someone has a time machine, let me know. <laughs> I'd like to try one. Uh, but yeah. Time is always moving forward, and given that time is always moving forward, that means that your options premium is always going to be decreasing. And so that's why income strategies sell options, because it is the one guarantee um, that options are generally going to be losing value over time. So example of income strategies that you know take advantage of this are covered calls, which we'll be talking about today cash secured puts, credit spreads, and calendar spreads. Uh, there are other, you know, more crazy and advanced options out there that also work for this um, to pull in that income. But these are the basic ones that we are going to be mostly focusing on uh, here and in the future. Uh, let's see. We talked about calendar spreads last time, so we'll probably talk about the other two in future sessions. For uh, the calendar spreads, um, these are different than the ones I talked about last time because last time I was focusing on them as an ER kind of play. Uh, but for these ones, it, calendar spreads is the more traditional use of it, um, not the niche example that I talked about last time. Okay, so why data matters for income strategies for options? So here's a, a little chart here. Um, it, and it shows, you know, over time and option value. So we kind of already know that, you know, options decay over time uh, and they lose their premium value, especially if they are out of the money, right? Or even at the money. So we know that uh, the closer 
an option's contract is to expiration, the higher that data value is, right? The higher that, um, the faster it's going to be losing that money, right? So here on this chart, you can you can see that general curve. It's just a theoretical curve. Um, actual options pricing does doesn't always follow the exact, you know, theoretical predicted outcomes that we we expect to see. Uh, but generally speaking, this is what we we see, right? So we see here that you know the biggest drop in data more than half of the drop in option value is going to occur in the last 30 days of um, a cop option contract expiring. And so this, this is important for us to pay attention to and because that's how we're going to capture our income with these strategies. So data and strike and their relationship, right? So uh, this is taken from Tastyworks. Uh, it's a options brokerage that I like to use. And that aside, um, here that it shows basically the data decay, right? So we see that at the money options actually lose value um, the quickest, right? And, and the reason for that is because at the money has the most value to lose because it has the highest probability of becoming in the money at expiration, right? So because it has more value, um, when it gets closer to expiration, that value decreases even faster because it's just at the money. If it's out of the money or in the money, then that decay is still fast, right? Especially for out of the money calls, the data decay is still high. But because the value uh, or the premium extrinsic value of the out of the money calls is decreasing so quickly, there isn't as much uh, data decay to take advantage of. So that's why when we pick our strikes for our options, which is the price that we expect, uh, you know, the underlying asset to reach or hit, we want to try to pick something that we think is going to be just right at or right under, right? So that will give us the best. Um, income revenue from this strategy. So we want to pick something that we think has a chance of going in the money, but not quite, right? So just add the money. Okay. So we have our income strategies here, a uh, little table here. And generally speaking, um, not sure why I organized this chart this way. Probably could have organized it better. I should have put the spreads together and the column puts on one side, right? But basically, spreads are usually a little bit higher risk compared to our covered calls and cash secured puts. Okay. So less risky covered calls, cash secured puts. And then higher risk is credit spreads and calendar spreads. Um, I do want to note that this is just relative, right? A spread is still less risky than, say, doing naked calls or naked puts, which would be basically selling um, selling calls, for example, without having any protection, So, which is a naked call. Um, using a spread still gives you some form of protection, but it doesn't have as much protection or at is higher risk than say covered calls because it's more volatile. So remember that these risk aspects are just on a relative spectrum here. Uh, in this table, I also describe when you would use it or when I would use it, as well as the cons. So just go through them, uh, going through them one by one. We'll start with covered calls here. We're gonna be using covered calls to generate steady income on stocks that we own long term or want to long term own long-term. The cons of covered calls is the higher cost. And the reason for that is because in order to do covered calls, again, we have that protection, right? So that means that we have collateral. So that collateral in this case of covered calls is going to be 100 shares in order to sell one contract. So the cost is a lot higher for covered calls than um, other types of plays, uh, for example, a spread. So going into that credit spread. So in this case, with a credit spread, 
we are selling a spread. So two different strikes on the same day, right? For a credit. In other words, we're receiving money for that spread. So usually, uh, just for example, if it's a, if you're doing calls, then you would sell the closer strike and then you will buy the further strike because the further strike is going to be cheaper than the closer strike, right? So you're going to receiving the net difference of that as, um, as credit. But that's also a reason that there's a higher risk. If your stock is highly volatile and for some reason it goes in the money, then you have to pay um, the width of that spread. So for example, if you say sold ADC, so um, $80 strike, right? And then you, you bought 85 strike, and then you got a net credit of $1, um, which is $100, right? Then for some reason, say the stock goes to $85 or $86, as long as it's above that further strike you sold, then now you're on the hook to pay it back $500, right? So basically you would have a net loss of $400. So it's higher risk, um, more volatile, but it's a lot cheaper to play than covered calls. So this is all just relative again. Uh, the disadvantage of a credit spread is also that you cannot wait it out. So for example, with covered calls, you hold shares. And with shares, you know, as long as you're bullish on the stock, you can hold long term and just wait until until your position recovers. So with a credit spread, you don't have the option because you have an expiration date. If on that day it's a certain price, then that's it. You have you you either owe money or or you um you know you collected that premium, right? So that's that. Uh, cash secured puts. Um, for this kind of play, it's it's useful for value investing. Similar to covered calls, uh, it's a little bit different, and it's also good for income plays. I know Warren Buffett likes to use this a lot. Um, and I'm trying to think of an example here. Uh, but let's just say, for example, you wanted to buy Apple, right? Say that Apple is, I'm not sure what the stock price closed on Friday, uh, but let's just say it's $130, okay, per share. And you, let's say that you think it's too high. Or, or actually, let's let's rewind back. Let's say that Apple is at you know one hundred forty, one hundred fifty dollars, and this was two weeks ago, or or something like that. And let's say that you you like Apple long term, but you think that the price is is just too high right now. You don't want to buy in at all time highs on the market. So what you do with cash secured puts is that you sell a put at the price that you're willing to pay for the shares. So say that I sold 130p um, for February 19th or yesterday. And I actually don't, I think Apple actually closed below 130. Somebody, anybody know? Uh, let me see. Switch to my regular watch list here from crypto. Uh, uh, where's Apple? Yep. So Apple actually closed um, at 129.87, right? So it closed below 130, right? And one thing that was bearish about Apple to me was I broke her trend line for March 2020. Uh, it had been holding this the whole time and then it broke um, last week. But anyways, uh, that aside, say, say that you, it was over here at 140, right? About two weeks ago two to three weeks ago, and you, you like Apple long-term, but you think it's too expensive. So you sold 130p for 219 because you're like, I'm willing to buy Apple at $130, but I'm not willing to buy it right now at $140. And then say that you sold, I have no idea what the premiums were at that time, so this is just a total random guess, but say, say, say that it was worth, um, those puts were worth, I don't know, a dollar. <laughs> So you would have collected that $100 premium for those cash secured puts. And to play the cash secured puts, the reason why it's called cash secured is that you have enough money to buy 100 shares of Apple at $130 each. So you would have uh, 1000 or sorry, $13,000, right? Um, 
So in order to do that, you would want that because you don't want to sell these things naked. Otherwise, you'll owe a lot of money. Uh, and that's just really risky. Um, but going back to this example here, you collected that $100 in premium. If Apple yesterday actually closed above 130 we would have just collected that $100 for free. Not really for free because we took on risk, right? But, but basically, that premium would be ours to collect, and that would be income generation there. That's how it works into the income strategy. Now, for value investing, which is what uh, Warren Buffett does, is because Apple closed under 130 that means that we are now obligated to buy 100 shares of Apple at $130. So we would pay, you know, $13,000, but we collected that premium of $100. So our net basis is actually, um, you know, the total we pay is $12,900. Or our cost basis is $129. And as you can see, Apple is actually $129.87. So we actually had a, a profit from that. Um, if you had sold, you know, 130p to 19 for at a $1 um, cost, right? So this is a, a good example of you know, how to do value investing. It's like you want to buy the dip, but you don't know when the dip is. You can sell cash covered or cash secured puts. And then, you know, if the price hits that point, great, you're in at a cheaper price. And you also collected that premium, so you got a discount. And then if it's above it, oh, well, you didn't get into the position. It was more expensive than you wanted to pay for the stock anyways. And guess what? You collected income, right? You collected that $100 premium. So this is a, um, you know, it's a really good strategy as well, along with covered calls to generate that income if you have the account size to buy 100 shares of, of these stocks that you want to sell puts or do covered calls, on, right? Uh, anyways, great strategy. If you ever want to enter something on a dip, uh, and you get a discount, right? Okay, moving on. Calendar spreads. So calendar spreads, uh, usually use it in low volatility situations, uh, similar to the credit spread. Um, and that's just because it's more predictable, right? You know what's going to happen. You want the stock to stay flatlined because you just want to collect premium on the front dated option while the front dated option loses value and the back dated option maintains value. This, and this is mostly just collecting data difference, right? So the cons is that it's non-directional and again, you can't, you can't wait it out uh, or at least not as long uh, because you have an expiration date, right? But for calendar spreads, you know, you can take leaps and that will give you more time for your play to pan out. And then you can just sell um, shorter dated options against your leap calls. And a leap call is something that is, you know, one out, one year out or more. Uh, I mean, you can also do, you know, a few months out if you want and sell shorter dated options. That works as well. Uh, we kind of talked about that last time. So going back to the recap of it. So basically, you might have noticed that there is a very big similarity between calendar call spreads and covered calls. Basically, a calendar call spread is a poor man's version of a covered call because you don't need to own 100 shares. You can just use a leap call, for example, as your collateral, right? And it's a lot cheaper to own a leap um, contract on, on the options than to own 100 shares. Usually, uh, that's the case. I'm going to try to catch up with chat. I know some folks have been helping out, like JTW and 007. Uh, thanks for helping out. Okay. I think you guys have got the check covered, so <laughs> thanks a lot for your help. Um, so uh, again, quick recap of this. I'm not going to try to go into too much detail on the calendar call spread because we talked about this last time. Uh, just recapping since it's related to the income strategies that we're talking about now. Uh, usually when you are, you know, you use it when you're neutral bullish. Um, there are the Greeks. Uh, I'm not going to go through those. You achieve max profit when the asset is at the strike price when the front dated option expires. Because uh, if it's above that, 
then um, that means it's in the money and you need to pay up 100 shares, right? Because we're short that contract. So uh, we don't really want to do that. So usually we prefer it if it's, you know, right at the strike or right under the strike. Um, and, and you mean mostly you're gaining value on this because of data, right? We're, we're just trying to crush the premium on the front data option while the back data option maintains its relative value. Uh, since data is always going to be higher on uh, the front data options, just like in that graph we showed earlier. So uh, my version that we talked about last time is a little bit different from this typical income strategy. It, my version is the ER calendar spread, and it's more of a, a really, really specific use case, right? Uh, I haven't really seen other people use this strategy before, and I don't really see it online. Um, I think I've seen like one mention of it being used like that, but usually when I look up calendar spreads online, it's it's basically the typical income strategy. They want low volatility situation. My version is is you know a lot more volatile. Uh, and I'm just trying to take advantage of IV crush. So, um, you know, this is just a recap of my February ER calendar spread account strategy. So over the month, I had 15 plays, uh, and I try to size about, you know, a, approximately 2K each. Sometimes it was a little bit less depending on my risk tolerance. And a big tip for you all, uh, you know, my this strategy is is really risky, right? Any ER play can always be considered a lotto. And that's why I always just size in, you know, I always say, oh, I'm only sizing in half of my normal position. Or sometimes I say I'm sizing in a quarter of my normal position. Because all these ER calendar spread plays are risky. You never know what's going to happen with an ER. Stock can shoot up a lot. Stock can crash a lot. Or it can stay flat, which is what we want. Uh, so anyways, that's why I always size in, you know, equal amounts, try it as close as possible. And I try to play multiple ERs because that increases my chance of success. Because overall, I've had about an 80% win rate with this type of play. And that's 80% win rate is just based on from holding overnight. So I buy it at close right before ER, like an hour before maybe max. And then I sell it the next day. And market open or within you know an hour or two right um okay so uh just going over my recap of my stats uh cost for this month was about 29k so again about 2k each for each play my total profit was nine thousand um, dollars nine thousand three hundred dollars and my total loss was two thousand three hundred fifty dollars right about so my net profit was uh, about $7,000 or about 24% of the total amount that I risked. So pretty good strategy. Uh, and this is why I always say if it opens up at 30% or more at open, I just sell it right away, even if we can take advantage of data decay on those um, ER calendar spreads. Um, you know, sometimes uh, it goes up from 50% to 100% by the close of the day. But I don't like taking that risk if I don't have to, if we're already up 30%, because that's already above my average win. So I, I always just close those out as soon as I can if it's up 30%. Uh, another note I want to talk about here is this loss of $2,349. This is assuming that the plays I'm still holding are going to $0. So this, um, you know, if you've been following the alerts that I've been posting on ER calendar plays, this includes Fastly as well as uh, COTY. So I'm still holding both of those. Um, I think COTY actually has a chance to go go in the money. Uh, we let the front options expire already, so we collected the full premium on those, and now we're just holding the long calls in the chance that the um, play basically recovers its value, right? Because both of those stocks drop pretty heavy. Uh, and that's usually what I expect with ERs is that in the opening hour, we usually see a really, really wide range. And that's why I play these is because at some point in that first hour, you're very likely to have profits, right? This doesn't always work out, as we know. Um, but yeah, this loss is assuming that those are going to zero. Uh, I, I do think that they still have a chance, but I'm just chalking it as a loss for the purpose of this um, recap.
Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. And then in the example of the your counter spreads I'm still holding, you can also treat that as if you are getting a discounted uh, long-term call. And just some more additional advice is, usually I'm only playing one week out on these ER calendar spreads. In other words, it's very high risk, right? If you wanted less risk, then a recommendation I would have would be to actually put it to a monthly or further out. You would still sell the ER, I mean, um, sell the options contract expiring closest to the ER because that will have the greatest EIV. And then you would sell a further dated contract however long you want, uh, because that IV will be more normal, right? And then we're trying to take advantage of that IV crush basically on the front option, as well as the IV, sorry, as well as data. And this is why these ER plays are a little bit different and uh, they offer more lucrative reward as well as higher risk um, compared to your normal cover, or sorry, not cover, call calendar spreads. Uh, but, you know, getting that further calendar spread, that leap call or uh, monthly calls uh, when doing those ER calendar plays basically allows you to get a really discounted call for a long-term hold because you can just hold that call now after your front option expires worthless if you are bullish, long-term bullish on a stock. Um, so it's just a good way to get a cheaper discounted long-term call. Um, and that's one way to, to take advantage of that as well when the IV is really high. Okay, uh, this lesson will be recorded, yes. And how far out of the money uh, do you usually go on covered calls? Um, so that's just depending on your risk tolerance. Usually I'm gonna be assessing the technical uh, as well as fundamental analysis to determine what I think is good. And then I'll be looking at the Greeks as well. I'm gonna be going over all of these um, variables and guidelines and general recommendations of what to look for on how to identify a good play for these uh, in a couple slides. So just hang on for that. And yeah, uh, as 116 Life said, perfect. Uh, you're right. You know, as long as you're comfortable selling your 100 shares at that strike price, it doesn't really matter, right? Of course, we want to pick an optimal strike price so we can get the most value out of our play. But I mean, you know, if you're selling a covered call and it hits that strike, it's not a big deal. You're, you're in green, right? That's the most important thing. As long as you're green, it's good. Um, but yeah, we'll go over that in a little bit again. So uh, a rich man's calendar spread, right? <laughs> because the calendar spread is a poor man's covered call, I was like, maybe a covered call is a rich man's calendar spread. <laughs> um, but what is a naked call? So selling calls are margin without collateral. So that would be not recommended highly not recommended why because you have unlimited risk if you sell a naked call and it goes into money say i don't know say say you sold um say you sold a thousand c on tesla or something last year before the split <laughs> because you're like there's no way tesla is going to a thousand dollars for example right uh and then now suddenly, you know, post split is what, $800? I don't even remember what the split was. I, I don't remember if it was a one to four or one to five split. Um, or did I get that backwards? Uh, but anyways, <laughs> you'd be on the hook for, for a couple thousand dollars, right? Per times 100. So you'd be on the hook for a lot of money. Uh, and basically, we don't recommend selling naked calls. I don't recommend it. I mean, if... <laughs> If you really want to risk it all, go ahead. But I highly discourage you from doing that because you have unlimited risk and it's just not worth it. Um, the chances of losing so much is is just so much greater than what you're getting from selling a naked call. Just do cover calls. So like, what is a cover call? It's the opposite of a naked call in that sense because we do have a risk limit. Uh, we're writing calls and we have shares already as a collateral. So the only thing that we can lose are those shares, um, which we already own. So in other words, with a naked call, you're selling on margin. In other words, you might not have that money, aka they can go after your assets, your house, your car, whatever, if you don't have enough money to pay, pay up, right? 
um, with a covered call. Of course, you can still lose that much money, but you have shares as a collateral. And because you already own the shares, technically, you can't really, uh, you know, if, if it goes into money, you're not going to be losing any money. You're just going to be getting less money, right? So that's that. When do you use it? Uh, usually, you're going to be using cover calls when you are neutral to bullish. And you want to own shares of a, of a particular stock for long term, or you already own shares of a stock for long term, and you want to produce additional income. So I know a lot of folks probably, um, you know, if, if you have like any kind of retirement account or whatever, you probably have a lot of shares of something in there. Uh, you can produce extra income on it by selling options against it, right? Just to collect that extra income. And you can sell far out of the money if you want, just to provide like an extra, you know, I don't know, 1% a year or whatever it might be, uh, if you don't want to be as quote unquote risky, right? But it, it is a advantageous thing to do if you own something long term and, um, you know, you don't think that you're going to sell anytime soon. Uh, it also is useful for providing a little bit of downside protection for your long-term assets because that premium that you're collecting on that call you're selling basically says that, hey, uh, I can lose whatever this premium is on the stock price and I will still be green on the play as a whole, right? Uh, the cons to this is that you limit your upside because um, you have a, a strike on your call Say again, going back to Tesla, say it's $800 right now. Uh, I don't remember what it closed on Friday actually, but say it's $800. And say that I sold those $1,000 strikes against my shares. That means that if Tesla goes above $1,000, I am obligated to sell to the buyer of those calls, those Tesla shares at $1,000. So say for example, it goes to $1,500, then I'm missing out on the profits of $500 per share, right? You do have that premium collected as well, though. So technically, it's not a uh, $1,500 versus $1,000 difference in profits. Um, it's less because of that premium collected. But you do limit your upside. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, you're, it's a gain. A win's a win to me, right? Um, and, and so I think this strategy is still a really, really safe alternative. Uh, and then with going well along with what I just said earlier, I just mentioned that, but you can have your shares called away. So that's what happens when the buyer exercises the calls uh, because they'll exercise the calls if the calls are in the money, right? Um, and then it, another factor to consider in all of this is your tax, right? So uh, if you hold your any position, right? Any asset for longer than a year, and then you sell it, you get charged long-term capital tax gains, right? So that's less than short-term capital tax gains, which is higher. So you pay more taxes if you're only holding something for less than one year. Um, so for example, in the case of selling covered calls, if you just bought your shares of Tesla, for example, last month, and then for some reason, uh, the covered calls you sold go in the money within two months and they exercise those calls, then that means that you're selling your, your shares within two months. So that means you're going to be charged those short-term capital tax gains. And if you had intended for that to be a long-term play and you weren't planning on paying you know, sh um, short-term capital tax gains, then this could be a factor to consider, right? Um, again, to, to me, I don't think it's a, it's a huge deal. Uh, just make sure that you're selling something that probably isn't going to be going into money. Uh, but regardless, a green play is green. Tax isn't going to charge you more than what you're you're profiting, right? So um, minor issue, but it's still something to think about for for those of you who uh, care about the taxes. Um, it requires and it, oh, another con again is it requires you to own 100 shares, which is expensive for some high profile stocks, Amazon, for example, right? Over three thousand dollars per share. That means if I want to sell covered calls on Amazon, I'm going to be shelling out more than $300,000 for that position, right? And I think most people probably can't afford a position like that. And this is why stock splits are kind of bullish um, because people can buy those shares cheaper. It looks cheaper. It's not realistically cheaper because it's, it's 
you know, the market cap doesn't really change. There's nothing to say that the market cap should go higher, but it looks cheaper. It looks more attractive to investors. And now you can more easily do covered calls. And this is why I think, you know, if Amazon does a stock split for um, some reason, and I know Bezos said that he never wants to do one or whatever, but he used to do them. And um, I mean, Amazon has done them in the past, but it's been quite some time since they did that. Uh, it would be super bullish for that stock um, and probably a big boost for the general market as well. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, but anyways, uh, that's one of the cons of covered calls is the expense for it. And thanks, JTW, for answering all the questions again. <laughs> Uh, a rich man's calendar spread continued. So how do you open a covered call? I kind of went over this as I kind of went over the example earlier with Tesla. Uh, but basically, you're going to buy to open 100 shares of a certain stock. And in, in this example, I said XYZ. I don't know if XYZ is actually a ticker. Uh, I hope it's not. <laughs> but say that we bought XYZ at $40 per share. And then we're going to sell to open uh, the March 19th 50C and say that is $1.50. Uh, and so the math behind this, right? So you're going to be paying $4,000 total for those shares. And then we sold a uh, premium. So we sold that contract for 319.50C at $1.50. So that's $1.50 times 100. So we collected $150 in credit when we opened this position. So that means our cost basis per share is $38.50, meaning that this is also a, another way, an alternative way to get discounted shares in a sense, right? If you don't think that that strike is going to hit, then this is a way that you can get shares cheaper than what it currently is at than what the actual price is. So um, the max theoretical profit is going to be at when XYZ is at or even over $50 at the close of 319, right? And the reason why even over is because we're already saying that we're going to sell the shares at $50 if that's in the money, right? So that means that no matter what it's pegged, the max profit is going to be $50 um, per share and then whatever we collected on the premium. So... Uh, that means that, and I think I accidentally deleted a line here. Yeah, I did. Um, but the max theoretical profit would be 50 minus 40 equals 10. 10 times 100 is $1,000, which is what it says if just shares, right? That's your max profit if it was just shares, if it hit $50. And then um, you would collect the additional dollar, or sorry, $150 on top of that. So that means your max gain would be $1,150 on the plate which is more than 25%. Now, your break even, so this is the downside protection of a cover call, is going to be 40 minus $1.50 because that's what you got uh, as credit for selling the contracts. So that's 38.50. So as long as the shares remain above 38.50, you don't lose on this play. Whereas if you just had shares, if it was at 38.50, then you would have lost $150. So really, uh, cover calls are a great way if you plan on having 100 shares plus of anything using covered calls it is a great um, method for generating that additional downside protection as well as additional income stream uh, of course you do limit your upside again right so our max profit is 1150 that means that our next um, upside i'm not sure if it's called a break even but your max upside that you would want to see the stock at would be 5150, right? Because that's how much um, our max profits would be. If it's over 5150, then that means that we missed out on some profits. Okay. Okay. So, how to find good covered calls? Um, I'm going to go over the variables that I look at as well as provide my general guidelines or suggestions. And remember that these are not absolutes. In trading, there aren't really... Um, I guess there probably are some absolutes as well, but I mean, really, it's just up to your risk tolerance, right? 
It's up to you how you want to play. And this is just the strategy as I see it and how I think that it could be best taken advantage of. Uh, but again, everybody's got a different trading style. So if you find something that fits your trading style and it works well for you, then that's what you do. Uh, so, you know, usually these strategies you refine as you go, because the more you do it, the more you see, and the more you'll realize that, you know, maybe certain types of tickers have a certain type of trend, then you can take advantage of that. So it's just like the calendar spreads. Normally you do that in low volatility situations when low IV, because you don't want it to move. You just want to collect the premium on data. But I uh, took advantage of high IV skew during ERs. And I only do it when there is a high IV skew because I want that IV crush on that front option in order to collect that profit. This is a really, really, you know, specific example that is unusual. And so again, remember, these are just general guidelines. If you find a specific, unique strategy that works really well for you, then that's what you should go with. Um, so, all right, let's go through the variables now. Delta. So usually for Delta, and Delta is essentially the, the probability that those strikes are going to go in the money, right? So if you see a delta of 25, that means there's a 25% probability that those strikes are going to go in the money by expiration. Okay. And the other thing that delta represents is the amount um, that your options premium price is going to go up per dollar increase in the underlying asset, right? So if it's 20.25, for example, that means that every single dollar that um, the underlying asset is going up, the premium is gonna increase by 25 cents, right? So that's, that's the general relationship. When it gets close to one or 100%, uh, basically it, that means that it's super deep in the money. Um, yeah, and, and so that's, because the probability of it being in the money at expiration is really, really high at that point because it's so deep in the money. So that's that's what delta is. Uh, just to highlight that again. And usually for delta for covered call specifically, we're going to be aiming for 25 to 45 is, is my general ballpark range. Uh, 30 is a well-established delta um, that's researched in the industry. And there are actually some... Uh, funds that track this they track the spy or um, not spy but they track the s s p 500 the center import 500 and they sell out of the money strikes on on that and they there's already etfs that do this regularly so you can check those out too if you don't want to um you know do the process yourself of say owning a s p 500 etf equivalent and then Selling covered calls. There's already ETFs that do this, right? Uh, so we'll probably take a look at some examples later when we go into the more practical ap application. Um, IV, so that's the implied volatility. So usually we don't want IV to be too high uh, because if the IV is too high, that means that the stock might be going like parabolic or something. Um, and it's just really, really volatile. So it might be hard to have a good risk reward ratio for those cover calls. Uh, again, this is just a suggestion, right? So usually we like to see about two times your delta. So for example, if I picked a delta of say 30 on my strikes, then I want to see the IV maybe about 60%. Being over or under that is, is fine. It, it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, but you know, this is just a general guideline. And, and but typically we do want to sell high IV. Um, and I, and here I mentioned, you know, but not when IV is always inflated. So if the IV is always inflated. That means a stock is is basically acting like a penny ticket, right? Or some kind of hype stock. Uh, good examples of that would probably be GME, right, from last month, or any of those other high short interest stocks. And then now it's uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, and and still now, kind of now, was marijuana stocks, right? All of those have really, really shot up IVs. And then now the next big buzz is, you know, the, the crypto stocks. So you got Riot, Mara, et cetera. I mean, those have been going up for a while already, but um, those are things that have pretty high IV right now. And they, they just, you know, it goes up and down. Like I think Riot was open at like 70 something or whatever. It dropped to like 60 something and then went back up again. 
basically because it moves so much, it's hard to predict. So these guidelines are for finding good covered calls that are reliable to generate that steady income. If you want to play covered calls on the high volatility stocks, that's also okay. But the, that kind of play is, is different uh, than the income strategy type of play. We're, in that case, we're just trying to capture you know, more premium crush, et cetera, that kind of play. Uh, but general, sell high IV, but not when IV is always inflated, just for that risk reward ratio aspect. The next important thing is strike or moneyness. So we want to pick a strike that is out of, out of the money. Uh, why? Because we don't want to get our shares, you know, called away immediately, right? Um, and we also want to find something with good premiums so that we can sell our shares at that price, right? And also collect that premium. So for these things, um, you just use technical and fundamental analysis, look at the charts, look at what the news is behind it. Can this price hit? Another consideration, uh, I mentioned this as point number six, other consideration, ER and volatility event. If they have an ER on a particular strike day, that is going to throw this income strategy off. Because usually before ER, the IV is going to start spiking up. And it will maintain relative premium. Even though data is supposed to be decaying the options, they might maintain value throughout the whole entire week until the actual ER event. Uh, and, and that's just because the interest or demand for those strikes is so high because people are always expecting big things from ER or um, say Apple Day or some other kind of volatility event, any kind of PR event, right? So those are that's something you're important to consider when you're considering those strikes as well on the expiration. Um, we're going to be aiming for, for expiration, monthly calls usually, 30 days to, I put 60 days here, but I think 45 days is better. Uh, usually about a month out to write is pretty good because that has a good premium. And we know that in the last 30 days of an options expiring, um, you know, data starts kicking in big, right? That's when we see, see a sharp drop in premium value from data. So that's why we picked those. Uh, and then demand. So this goes back into those other things of expiration. The reason why we're doing monthly calls is, is again, because of demand. You might uh, notice that for a lot of tickers, Usually, if you play the monthly calls, which would be, you know, for the February, it was 219. For March, it's 319. For April, it's 416. Um, those are the monthly calls, right? Those will always have higher volume and higher open interest than your weekly calls. And that's because your big institutions are usually going to be playing those monthly calls. They don't, they don't dabble so much with the weeklies. Um, and the reason why this is important is because it affects the bid-ask spread. So you might notice that on low volume tickers, things that aren't traded as much, and even in those ER calendar spreads that I, I've been alerting, sometimes it's really hard to get a fill. Uh, and I mean, spreads are usually hard to get fills anyways because you have two different strikes that you're trying to get in on. But if you did that like on, on a very high volume ticker, for example, SPY, that doesn't matter what day you're picking you can pretty much get a fill any time because that bid ask spread is probably only one cent apart, right? But um, for these covered calls, we're aiming usually for those monthly calls because there is better volume on them and the spread will be less and that will allow you to get a more, a better entry for your premium. So, you know, don't, don't hit that market buy button all the time. Uh, make sure you're getting a good price for your premium because that's, that's all calculated into your probability of success. If you're, you know, if your spread is 60 cents wide and, uh, you know, say the 30 to 390 and that's the width and you're hitting the ask at 390, you're paying an extra 30 cents. That's almost 10% more. Um, that's going to significantly affect the probability of success. So make sure you're using limit buys or sorry, limit buys, limit sells, those kinds of things when, when you're playing uh, options with wide spreads. Uh, that's just my recommendation there. Um, okay. Sorry, I'm going on a tangent there. Uh, so open interest and volume, we talked about that and we went over the ER and volatility events. There are also probably other considerations, um, uh, but I can't think of them right now. These are probably the important, the important variables.
uh reading the chat here one second i see you guys have been selling selling uh or doing covered calls on riot i know jtw has been doing that a lot uh, i'm actually also doing that so it's been really lucrative let's just say that uh so you know even if it's high iv it can still be really profitable it's just that there's higher risk and um general recommendations are you know less risky for cover calls which is supposed to be a more income generation type of play right and i will show you an example actually later of of a um high iv play that i took for cover calls all right anyways uh so actually going into that right now actual examples and the practical application so earlier this week, I actually did a covered call on uh, EBON. Uh, I think it stands for eBank te Technologies, something like that. Uh, but basically, it's a crypto-related ticker. They do mining hardware. Uh, so they, they manufacture mining hardware, and they sell it for crypto. Um, so, so basically, uh, for you know Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. I think they do a few other types of processors as well. but. Uh, I, I'm not too clear on that. Uh, they recently, or they've been announcing shift in business operations. I think at the end of last year, they announced that they were going to open a crypto exchange. Still nothing on that. Uh, and more recently, they announced you know, that they're going to go into crypto mining. And that's why it's been getting a bit of buzz and volume lately. Uh, and it's been flying. Again, uh, <laughs> this this ticker is a little bit I, I'm a little bit doubtful of it because they they don't really have a good track record. Uh, they were denied an IPO in Hong Kong, I believe. Um, they had the application rejected, and somehow they got accepted here, and they raised ninety million dollars as well. Uh, but in any case, I'm just playing the hype. Um, and I mean, if they actually do crypto mining, then you know they could actually turn a profit. But, uh, you know, I'm a little bit doubtful about the company. But that aside, I think all the crypto tickers right now are, you know, very, very highly hyped up. Um, overvalued or not, I, I don't know. It, it kind of depends. I haven't really looked into the fundamentals of all of them. Uh, but Ebon is definitely a little bit shady because they don't, they don't actually have any crypto mining yet. They just announced that they were going to do it and their, their stock has, has literally flown. Uh, so here's an example of something I did in my Tastyworks account earlier this week. I opened a covered call on Evon because I felt like it was it was really bullish. And again, this is different from the use case that I mentioned earlier with those guidelines. Um, the reason I did it is because I wanted to hop onto the crypto train with stocks. Uh, they're all going up, right? Riot is, you know, $60, $70. Uh, I felt like I missed the boat on Riot. I've been doing, I mean, I've been doing some like calendar spreads and stuff on Riot. But I felt like Ebon hadn't really pumped as much yet. And so earlier this week, I was like, you know what? I think I might, you know, I want to get onto that train of doing selling cover calls on these high IV things. And maybe I'll just buy some shares of Ebon and we'll go from there. So that's what I did. Uh, I bought 200 shares of Ebon. Uh, I forgot how much I bought it for. It was, it was around 11 something, um, which is pretty high, frankly. Uh, but I sold the March 1915 strike. Uh, actually, I don't even know how much I sold it for. <laughs> what does it say here? 748. So I sold, sold it for 748 for two strikes. I can't do the math on that. $374. So I sold them for $374 each. And I bought these 200 shares total for $2,300 ish. Uh, again, that's 11 something per share. As you can see on Friday close, um, Ebon actually closed below my initial entry price, right? Or actually close above. Never mind, I read this wrong. Uh, but my total gain is um, about negative $17. So it's still below the price that I bought it at. It picked up again on Friday. Um, and but we see here that my play is still positive, and the reason is because I sold these what I consider expensive covered calls, right? $374 for 15 strike. That means that 
Ebon by March 19th has to be at least $18 and uh what did I say again? $18 and 74 cents if uh, before I quote unquote lose potential profit on this play. And in the case of downside, I have protection because now I can go down to about $8 or $7 before this play is actually negative because of this collective premium. And that's why this play is positive right now, even though my shares are negative, it's because that premium, I'm collecting the premium on these 15 strikes. So $283. So total gain is $266. And I think my, uh, you can see here, my total entry price was actually 1000 Six hundred dollars ish. So, for for a couple day hold, this is actually a really really good percent gain, right? And and the stock went down. So you know, or actually kind of traded flat to be honest. Um, so calendar spreads were actually probably viable there too. But in any case, this is just an example of using a covered call, a recent example that I did, and uh, how it can protect you from downside, as well as give you a lot of potential profit. So I did the calculations on this, uh, and basically I can double my account if Yvonne hits $15 on March 19th exactly. Um, I think it's about 90% gain. So a lot of potential gain here. My downside is limited because um, as long as it holds above $700-ish, I'm not really going to be losing on this play. So that's uh, something we're going to take a look at now on how to find these covered calls. So we're going to go to barchart.com and explore this. Uh, Bob Manny, where do you go to find IV? Oh, JTW answered that. Yep, you can find that on your options chain. You can also find it on calculators online, which I am actually going to show you right now. Uh, let's do that first, actually, before we look at barchart.com on how to find these plays, right? Barchart.com is an excellent scanner tool. So I do recommend using it. It has a free as well as a paid version. Uh, the premium version is definitely helpful. Um, but if, if you don't want to shell out uh, that subscription price, then you know the free version works perfectly fine as well. So let's take a look at uh, optionsstrat.com real quick here. So you can see I use it a lot for all these calendar spreads I've been doing ER calendar spreads on, calculate every single one. Uh, if you're not doing this, I do recommend doing this in general for your plays. And that's just because it's, um, you, you wanna know, you wanna have a plan for your trade. Like what is my max profit? Am I just waiting for a hundred percent? Is that even going to hit? What's the probability it will hit? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, this helps visualize that a little bit better, and you have a graph as well as a table. I know I talked about this tool last time already as well, so I won't dive any deeper into that. Uh, we're looking at covered calls here. So let's go to covered calls. Covered calls I did was uh, Ebon, eBay International's Holdings. So we are long. So 100 shares is $11.05 right now. And say that I sold the March 19th strike, which is actually what I did. And then you have a slider here. I'm going to slide over to 15 because that's what I did again. Uh, this is going to be relative to the current price. So it's not actually reflective of my um, position. Since I entered in at a different price and I sold these strikes at a different price, but it's going to be relative to where we are right now. So what's going to happen from now, right? So usually, again, Friendly reminder, I set it to bid ask instead of mid. Middle uh, is what you should be trying to aim for, but I always set to bid and ask because that gives you a more realistic picture if you are really desperate into selling a call or something and you, you just hit the bid and ask, right? Uh, on high spread tickers, it matters more. So um, many asked uh, about IV and how to check it. So you can check on your broker, right? You can also check here. So if you click on this strike here, 15C, if you click on that flag, it sells you 15C, 319. You can change the quantity here. You can also change your quantity of shares up here, right? And you can change the price if you buy it at a different price. Um, but this is the price it's currently at. It tells you the bid and ask. Basically, all the data that you would expect to see in your options chain in your broker is here. This data is delayed though by 15 minutes. 
So you can see the IV right here, 289%, which is very, very high. Um, but I mean, all these high tickers have really high IV right now. So again, remember, we want to sell high IV. Of course, the general IV for this ticker is high already, uh, and that's just because it's it's going parabolic, right? So uh, those are the Greeks there, and I do use this tool to find those Greeks sometimes if I'm just trying to theorize good plays. So here you see the table. Uh, basically, at max, my max profit, you know, six hundred twenty-four dollars and fifty cents from here, and my break-even is eight seventy-six. Mine is actually a little bit lower, and that's because my entry price and the my sold price for the premium is different than what they have here. So here they're saying that you're going to collect two hundred thirty dollars in credit, and that's because that's what the current price of this contract is. Um, doesn't tell you. Doesn't actually tell you how much it costs for your shares because this is already it's assuming here that you already own this own these shares. So if you don't um, own the shares already, be sure to factor that, that into the cost of your play. So uh, it won't be a net credit, but it will be a net debit because you're you're buying the shares as well. Uh, max loss, right? So this is assuming that it goes to zero. So we just stretch out the table. You see your max loss is at zero. Um, and then your max profits, right? So usually when you get really close to max profits, you should never wait for max profits because the stock can turn around or do something else. If you're close to max profits already, just lock it in. There, there's not really any point in just, you know, I'm going to wait another two weeks for what? To collect another $20 or something? Like if you're collecting most of the profits already, uh, and just by looking at this, you can pretty easily assess that, then, you know, I would recommend locking in profits, right? So um, I do use this tool a lot uh, for all my plays just to see what's going on. And remember that if your IV drops, so for example, if um, say crypto is, is no longer of interest and, or EVA in particular has, has really bad news and no one wants to buy it anymore, um, and then you have an initial shock, right? And say that it's a few months later and no one, no one cares about the stock anymore and it becomes a dead penny ticker, right? Penny stock ticker then you would drop the IV. So when the IV drops, it will affect um, your what your profits look like and at what profit price points, right? So in the case of, for us, because we are selling the calls, an IV drop is actually beneficial for us. And if you click on this little arrow here, you'll see uh, Vega. Vega is negative, right? So Vega is what factors into IV. So when IV is dropping, then you have the, the premium of uh, is losing value, and that means that we're gaining that money. So an IV drop is really, really good for us, and this is why you're supposed to sell high IV options and buy when when the IV option or IV is low, right? Um, you're selling the high IV options because it's probably overpriced. They're expecting a huge move. It might not happen, and that's why you sell the high IV. If you do expect the move to happen, though, then obviously don't sell those calls, um, right? Uh, but for example, covered calls, this is fine because I'm okay with selling at $15. In fact, I would be happy to sell at $15 plus collecting that premium. All right. A lot of people talking about CCIV. Oh, is the presentation being blocked? <laughs> uh... I did not realize that the whole entire time, but thanks for mentioning that. I'll think about that for next time. <laughs> I should probably should have resized resized my stuff to to fit the screen, huh? Uh, I'll think about that for next time. Thanks for mentioning that. All right, let's go to barchart.com. So barchart.com has a covers calls screener, and so if you just go to barchart.com, I'll just uh, show you. So this is what it looks like. You know, it has some news things, and uh, they talk about stocks, ETFs, options, futures, currency. Um, really, really useful website if you're looking for scanners or just information about, uh, you know, assets and trading in general. For us, we're going to be looking over here at the options here at the top. So you click on that drop-down menu. They have screeners for pretty much everything, right? Uh, most everything that you need. And if you need more than what they show here, then there's always the premium option, 
so you can customize uh, a scanner to use. For our purposes today, we're gonna to be looking at these covered calls here. So let's click on that and then it will spit out all of these. So 1700 results. Um, and if you wanna see the whole list, you actually do have to, to pay or you have a 30 day trial as well, which you can use. Uh, and try that out. But if you want to look for particular things, uh, you can only see the first page, right? So, but if you click on a specific criteria that you're looking for or you're focusing more on it, then you can arrange, rearrange the list and you can get those items. Um, filters here on the left of the results button. So here you can set those important things or those variables we mentioned earlier. So maybe that you, you don't want to trade a low volume option ticket. You're like, well, I want the option to have at least, so I can't do it because I'm not logged in, but uh, say you want you know the option contract to have at least a thousand trade every single day or whatever, then you can increase that here and can change that uh, open interest as well. And open interest is just however many people are, are holding those contracts at the close of the day. Um, and then you can change, you know, the other settings as well. So we're going to be looking for, you know, 30, about 30 to 45 days or 30 to 60 days. And we're going to focus mostly on monthly ex expirations, right? Uh, you can look at weekly expirations as well. I think weeklies are fine. Uh, they're just, just make sure that when you do trade those weeklies that there's enough volume on them and that the bid ask spread is not too wide so that you can easily get into those plays, right? So that you're not just hitting the ask on, on a wide spread. Uh, so weekly expirations are fine too, but you know, general recommendations for a covered call as a safe income strategy will be those monthly expirations from 30 to 45 days out, right? So that's what we're looking at there. Uh, moneyness, so this is how far out of the money those strikes are. So you can look for a specific range here. 25% just means that the strike is 25% away from uh, the current price of the asset, right? Um, the bid price if you want to customize that as well so that those are the settings there and how to use them and going over how to actually use this screener if we're looking here uh, i know somebody mentioned cciv in the chat earlier and that they were doing cciv well guess why it shows up on the scanner so uh, I, I was looking at those too because you know cciv is, is spec and um, they have that merger stuff going on with uh, lucid and whatnot and people are really really gung-ho about the stock and so ivs are completely shot on it uh, you see here is 280 percent which is really high all of these are really high ivs actually um but that's great because we want to sell high iv again remember we want to sell high iv because that means the premium price is really really high so just going over an example of how to read this which so we're just going to look at cciv here so we're going to look at this first one uh we see that the current price is 52.94 the strike that they want you to sell is 60. The moneyness is 13%, negative 13%. That means we're 13% away from the strike. So that means the stock needs to gain 13% before that strike is at the money or in the money, right? Um, the expiration date. So again, we're picking monthlies, right? Uh, the bid. So that's 1330. So that means that these strikes for 60, C are currently 1330. So that means that if I want to play this covered call play, it would cost me $39.64 per share. So that multiply that by a hundred, right? And we see this is the BE or the break even. Uh, if you hover over any of these, they actually explain what, what they all mean. So if, if you get confused while you're using this online, you know, go feel free to hover over and figure out what, what it is. Um, but yeah. So the break even point is basically where you would break even. I mean, pretty straightforward there. And that's just because this is the net debit, right? So your net debit is thirty nine sixty four. That means that we have, you know, about thirty three percent drop in, in the current price before we we hit this net debit, um, and that's where we break even. So break even is essentially your protection. How much protection do you have on the cover call that you're playing? So the higher the break even percent is, the more downside protection you have, because you can drop a lot more on that stock and still be profitable. Volume again, very high. Open interest is also very high. Delta is 58, which I think is okay. Kind of high on the high side again. 
Um, if you want to go for that more typical income, more less risky type of cover calls play on like, you know, uh, stable stocks like Apple or whatever, then you're going to be looking for about 30, right? 25 to 45. I think 60 is still okay for our purposes though, right? 280% um, IV, we want to sell that high IV. And then potential return, 51%. So that means that if this is our max profits, that if CCIV is at $60 or higher, this is the best case scenario. That's our maximum profit, 51.4%, which is pretty good. So if you want to weigh in, you'll notice that the break even is directly, there's a correlation, right? Between break even and potential return. The higher your break even is, generally speaking, the less your potential return is going to be. Um, that's just a relationship, right? The less risk you have, the less reward, the more risk you have, the more reward. This is true for any kind of trading. Um, do you want to take that risk or not, right? So this is something that you have to decide on your own between balancing out break-even as well as potential return. If you're more conservative, then you're probably going to want to have a higher break-even percent. And you're also probably going to want to filter for things that have you know a closer delta value of, say, 25 to 45. Because remember, delta is a probability that these strikes go in the money. So the higher delta is, there's a 65% chance or 64.5% chance that these 1250 strikes I'm selling will go in the money. That means I will lose my shares. But that also means that I will gain this money, right? Because I'm going to be selling at 1250 from $11. And I will also collect the premium of 350 So it, they're, they're all just factors that you have to balance out. Uh, for the typical income strategy, what you're going to be doing is you're going to have a stock you want to own long term. Say, I don't know, Amazon, Apple, whatever, right? You have 100 shares of it, and you're just going to be selling, selling cover calls, premium the whole entire time. And that's why this is so important for those kinds of plays, because you want to hold it long term and you don't want to have that short term capital tax gain. Then you're going to want to have this delta lower between 25 to 45, because you want that. You don't want to have to sell your calls. You just want to collect the max premium and maybe be right at the strike or right under the strike at expiration. That will be perfect. So uh, having said all of that and going through this, if you click on these little plus marks here, it gives you a little bit more detail about the company and shows you the daily chart. So not the best chart, right? This is a line chart. We prefer to use candle charts because that allows us to do more, a little bit more analysis on it. So we use, I mean, I use trading view, but... Uh, this does give you a little bit of a brief overview of the company. So you can see headlines here. Um, they're low and they're high. The average volume, 52-week uh, range, which is the daily high and low. And, and they give you all the other details here as well. Uh, but, you know, click on that if you want to explore more about this particular ticker and you just need some brief info or highlights about the company. So usually I, this, I use this as a quick, brief glance to just determine what's going on with the stock. So we see here that, you know, less than, you know, about 10 days ago, not even 10 days, this stock has already gone up 100%. That means this strike is, if, if it continues this parabolic motion, it's probably going to go into money. And that's why this delta is, is so high. And this, that's why this IV is so high. If I just wanted to use covered calls as an income type play, say that you have a large account of, I don't know, say, for example, a million dollars, and you just want to collect income. You don't need to have high risk plays, right? You just want to collect that steady income, say, you know, a few percent, five percent, ten percent extra a year. Then you're going to be looking for something that isn't going like this. You want something a little bit more flat with a steady, slow uptrend. Then you can just sell out the money strikes and keep doing that every single month or even every week if you want, right? And then you just keep collecting that premium. Uh, in, in this case, the reason why I did that cover call on Ebon is because I just want to play it for short term, right? That's my goal is to play this for short term while the hype is up and I want to sell it at at least $15 and that's why I took that strike of $15. Uh, and my potential return on that was about 90 something percent. So this one is 65%, but yeah. So that's, that's those are the things that I'm looking at when I'm looking at the ticker. And uh, let's go to trading view here. So pull up Ebon. 
right? So we can take a look at, you know, what other things that you can consider when you do your technical analysis. So right now, the fundamentals of Ebon are probably pretty bad. They're not a profitable company at all. Uh, in fact, they had like, I think they reported no revenue at some point um, in the past. A pretty shady company, but they have a lot of hype right now, and that's because of crypto. And they announced that they were going to do crypto mining. Uh, whether they actually do that or not, I'm not sure. So that's why this is not a company that I really want to quote unquote invest in long term, but I only want to play the short term trend. And that's why I um, did what I did. Uh, so, you know, again, looking at this chart here, it, it's got up before $15 or so on September. So that's what we're probably going to be looking for. And that's exactly why I picked 15 strike. It's because the previous all-time high was near that $15 strike, so I expect that to act as a uh, potential resistance area, right? It could also just completely overshoot it because all these crypto tickers right now are just going parabolic. Um, but I'd be happy with selling it at $15 from $11 and, and collecting that $300, uh, $370 ish premium that I collected already, right? Because that means it has to go to $18 before I lose out on potential profit. So to me, that's perfectly fine, and that's that's why I picked what I did. Uh, not really much else to analyze in terms of technical for this company because basically it's just all about the fundamentals right now, which is big hype on crypto. So people are buying it up. If you want, put some fibs in. <laughs> I always put fibs in just to see what's going on. Low, high, right? So we see 1.618 will be $21. Uh, another note of word um, on Ebon is that I, I did, you know, full disclosure, I did take some spreads on, on it from 12.5 to 20 for 3.19. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's going to, you know, be profitable or not, but it was, it was about $1.10 per spread. So a dollar ten for a potential of seven hundred or seven fifty in profit. I was like, hey, it, it, this thing is going parabolic. Look at the huge volume increase past couple of days. It could it could hit that, um, and then I'll bail out, you know, once it gets close, right? Um, but yeah, that's what I looked at and and why I picked the fifteen strikes on my particular cover calls. Uh, but basically, you should be doing this kind of basic analysis, trying to see where it can go, where resistance might be. There's not a lot of history on Ebon on here, to be honest, and it's kind of a, I don't know, I guess a, I would call it a, a crap ticker. Uh, but So doing analysis on it is just kind of moot, because I think it's just, you know, it's just one of those parabolic hype stocks right now. It's like trying to do, for example, analysis on GME, right? Like, what kind of analysis would have told you, hey, we're going up to $500 or whatever, right? This is this wasn't exactly predictable. Like I got into GME too because I noticed that there was something going on with it, and I knew there was a lot of hype and um, rumors on it. And I started picking it up around thirty dollars, but there's no way I would have known it would have gone five hundred. And you know, I was considering selling covered calls on GME, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, in retrospect, you know, it might have been profitable because it didn't last up here very long and it went back down. But you know, you never know with these kinds of things and. With hype tickers, um, it's hard to say what's going on, right? So I would just use this break-even point as downside protection on what you think you know can happen to the stock. Um, for these kinds of more hype tickers, I prefer a higher break-even percent, uh, just because I know that they can easily go back down to zero, uh, or or like a really really low level. For Ebon, I think that's probably like. 380. So it's a, it's a lot lower. My break even point was about $7. So I can lose like $3 if we just go back to. Um, but, anyways, uh, those are the things I look at when I take covered calls uh, and how I use covered calls in the Ebon case, for example. Uh, I, I do encourage, you know, if you are looking more for a steady, slow income strategy, that you do use those variables that we mentioned in the PowerPoint slides 25 to 45 delta. Uh, IV about double that, so you know, fifty to ninety, or maybe even a hundred. It's okay. If there's some range, is fine. Uh, is what you're looking for for a steady income type of cover call play. Uh, but if you're just 
you know, playing any kind of hype ticker, you're day trading or whatever, and you're not looking for long term investments type of purposes, then, you know, doing these kinds of things, looking for these high potential returns, good break even numbers, uh, acceptable risk is, is fine. And looking at it that way. Um, and then if you ever own any other calls, long term calls, and you want to provide some protection to yourself or on your um, on your shares, you want to provide some protection on, for yourself, you know, you can always consider selling either covered calls or converting to a calendar spread. And I, I do that very, very frequently, right? I have ARC K leaps and I regularly sell weeklies and monthlies expiration calls on that when I don't expect the trend to be up. So I just keep collecting that premium and it prevents my leap from losing value because I'm collecting that premium, right? But I'm still holding that long-term position. Um, and sometimes this could be, you know, quite net profitable. Uh, if the, whenever the IV spikes up and then you, you sell those premiums and if it stays flat, then you're probably gonna collect a lot more profit at the end uh, when your leaps expire than if you had just been holding those leaps and waiting for that uh, increase in price, right? So um, those are, you know, selling calls, provide hedging uh, is definitely a good idea. Um, do take a look at the probability of whether it will hit or not. Again, that's Delta. Delta is the probability of whether the strike will go in the money. So that, that's basically the takeaways for today for covered calls or income strategies. We'll go a little bit more over some other types of income strategies, including selling cash secured puts uh, in future seminar sessions. So I, I do plan on continuing these seminars every two weeks, um, approximately. Uh, I will announce that in the Xtrades Discord as well. So make sure to join that if you aren't already on there. Um, we will be going through questions now, I believe. Let's, yep. Thanks again for attending the second seminar. Uh, and I'll be taking questions. When does Arc K not go up by A. Spencer? So, yes, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but this past week, the stock market's been kind of either flat or going down. So, it doesn't always go up. So, in that case, uh, I actually sold um, shorter term contracts on it and I collected the full premium on it. Uh, you know, it wasn't much, like $70 or something, but, you know, it, it, it was something and it allowed me to hold my long term calls with more confidence because I knew I was offsetting it by selling those calls. So sometimes if the market is flat or it's, you know, or even bearish, sell those calls, right? Against your position to hedge. Uh, of course, my, my leaps are, are out of the money, right? So that's why I was able to do that. Um, but even if it's not, you can do a diagonal spread and sell a further out of the money call uh, just to collect that slight premium difference, right? So. Uh, yes. Uh, how far should I buy a bull call spread? So, um, for the call spreads, I mean, it, it just depends on, on your, on your analysis, right? For, for buying any kind of security or option, you should have a timeline in advance when you take a play of when something is going to hit, when you think something will hit. And then usually what I do personally is I add time to that. So let's take, for example, uh, let's go back to trading view for a second here. Take, for example, all right, pull up, pull up the charts. So let's say RK, for example, right? Because we were already talking about RK. So um, might as well go back in. Uh, I actually alerted a buy on Arc K uh, earlier this week over here at one forty, about one forty seven, I think one forty six or one forty seven. I don't remember the exact. Uh, but I, I alerted um, April sixteenth calls on Arc K for one sixty. Why? Because one sixty is the uh, top over here, right? Also, um, the reason why I entered calls is because we are in this channel and I expected this trend line to hold. So that's why I alerted those calls. I did say that uh, I felt like I was getting in early because it could, you know, it could break this, right? 
but and uh, what it's done in the past few times is touch this trend line. Is that it had a couple days where it kind of bounced around the trend line, as you can see here and right here, uh, breaking below actually on this particular day, but bouncing back over. So I, I said I was getting in early when it was over here, but I felt like it was it was decent risk reward, and so that's why I took April sixteenth on those. Uh, and and I know I'm answering the question about the bull call spread, but this applies to any play basically. What I always do is I estimate based on my chart and my analysis where I think the price can go and when it can hit that, right? So if we expect that it to follow the same general trend of, of moving like this, I was like, okay, maybe it's going to hit 160 around March or something. It could hit earlier, but let's just say that it follows a more, um, a slower slope, right? Or maybe it hugs this support trend line and goes up instead of uh, jumping off of it like it normally does. So say it hugs it, then we're gonna hit my my strike price around March, mid March. So I always like to add time on top of that so that I'm not playing with my um, I'm not being killed by data, right? I don't want that data decay to be eating against my options that quickly. So then I'm gonna add time at least two weeks out. Uh, I I usually prefer to take monthlies, so I just was like, okay, well. We're already in mid-March. We can't take the March plays because that's too close. Like, what What if we reject here at 160 and, and my play doesn't go in the money? Uh, I don't want to be in that situation. So we're going to take April 16th, which gives me a lot more potential, right? Because on April 16th, if this trend still continues, we could be at 180 or we could be at 170 if this trend continues, right? But at least I think it will be above 160, uh, assuming trend continues to hold. So that's why I'm going to take April 16th. That's why I loaded April 16th for 160 strike because this is the previous top, right? It can act as resistance. And, you know, if, if all things go well, I could be, you know, 20 something dollars in the money. And, and I pay, paid about, uh, I think I paid, I forgot why I loaded that, but I think I paid about $700 per contract or $690 per contract. It was around there. So if, if at expiration we're at like 80, then that means it's worth $2,000 just on intrinsic value alone. So that's, you know, a lot of profit, right? But basically, this was a support bounce play. Uh, in order to get when you should play or what, how far out you should play your contracts, this is how I, I decide, right? Pick, pick a strike that you think is going to hit and then pick a time that you think is going to hit based on your analysis and add time to it. Always add time. I always think it's worth the premium of paying for more time on your plays instead of having the issue of where you're just right at strike at expiration because then your thing is worth zero dollars whereas if you had another month on your play and it was at strike you'd have some money on your play right and there's a chance that it will go further up so um always add time to your play it's worth the extra premium there's a reason why we're paying the extra premium and that's because the probability will be higher of success if you pay and buy time so uh, that's my general recommendation on how to pick strikes and the time frame for it. I hope that answered your question about when uh, you should set your expiration for the bulk cost spread. All right, let's take a look back at the chat here. Uh, let's see, when should you sell your covered calls? Okay, uh, yeah, Young Bull said that he closes them at 60% profit. Again, this is going to be uh, based on your own risk risk um, ratio, right? But the way I do it is that I like to use this, right? If I have covered calls on Ebon again, uh, let me reset this IV because I messed around with it a little bit. And let's change this chart range back to something a little bit more reasonable or ex within expectations. I usually just assess based on this. On the timeline, how far in we are, and how much more time do I have to wait for what kind of gains? You know, because at some point you're going to be like, oh, I, I feel like over here is pretty optimal in the middle of the chart, like 450. Like I, I can gain like another 150, 170 dollars, but I have to wait like another extra week. I don't feel like it's worth waiting that extra time when the stock can pull back on me. Or, or et cetera, right? So I use this to just assess for myself when I want to take profits. But as, as a general guideline, um, 
rewinding back to those ER calendar plays, ER calendar plays, I like to take profits at 30% plus. That's when I take profits immediately at open. If it goes above, I mean, if it's above that at open, perfect. I'll take whatever I can get, right? Uh, I For covered calls, um, usually once it gets closer to the expiration day, I will basically I'll just look at it and I'll assess it because I'll probably roll out the uh, option that I'm selling. So for those of you not familiar with it, uh, rolling out an option contract just means that you're changing the expiration date, right? So say that I had um, 15C for March 19th, then I will roll out this 15C to say April 16th, 15C. That's if the stock is not moving higher. If it is, then I'm just going to do 20. So uh, some um, brokerages such as Tastyworks, for example, provide a roll rolling uh, rolling out button, and you can just click on that, and it will you know do all the setup for you. But in, in any broker, it's the same thing. You can just sell your strike, uh, so you sell that contract, and then rebuy that contract in in two steps, right? Uh, it's just that in the other ones, you know, you have a one click button, and it sets sets it up automatically for you all in one operation, right? Uh, so it's just more convenient. But yeah, usually as we get close to the uh, expiration of the contract, if we're getting close to, say, $15, and I know I can get more gains out of this, right? But I, if I want to hold these shares long-term, like, for example, I know JTW has been uh, doing cover calls and Riot for a long time. So if I want to continue doing that and use it as a purely as an income strategy, I don't want to let go of my cover calls. So once you hit, like, you know, 30, 50% profits, I consider, you know, taking it out and then rolling out that strike, um, that option contract to a further out day or a higher strike because you don't want to, that's, this is, of course, assuming that the, the bullish run continues, right? You don't want to um, get your uh, long-term play or your shares get called away when the strike goes into money. On the other hand, if you don't mind getting called away and you know, it's already in the money, for example, then I was like, okay, I mean, if you don't mind selling it at $15 and you can just hold, right, and just just let it let it play out. Um, but usually, yeah, you would consider once you get close to the expiration date, say one or two weeks out, you can consider rolling out to, to a different strike uh, or even the last week, right? Uh, but this just depends on the price action and how close it is to, to your, um, the strike that you sold. Again, all things, Go back to the chart, right? For for me, I always refer to the chart for my actual decisions. The percentage stuff is just general guidelines uh, and rules for myself in order to prevent myself from either overextending or over risking or um, you know giving back profits to the market. So that that's uh, those are just general recommendations. At what percentage do you close your place if there is a loss? So for these, uh, I mean, in the case of covered calls, normally, I mean, it depends if you if you care about the company long term or short term, right? Uh, if you're in it for the long term, then you don't really care, because you know, rather it's just a discount in the share price, right? Say say that Apple, you know, right now is at one twenty nine. Uh, whatever, one twenty nine seventy four, I believe, and you know it's dropped from one forty. Do you sell it for for a loss, or do you want to just keep holding it and let it rise again? Right. If you are just selling cover calls as a income strategy, then we don't really care about that. We just keep selling those cover calls to provide additional downside protection while we wait for the stock to recover. Um, and I do want to mention that. Uh, along with cover calls and these income strategies, there's a more, uh, I guess, cyclical strategy. It's called the wheel. And we might talk about that later. Um, but basically, that would use a few different types of plays in order to constantly generate profits in a cyclical fashion. So we might talk about that in, in a future seminar uh, after we go through the other aspects of the wheel, because the wheel is basically a composite of different strategies put together in one strategy.
when I say leap, I, I do mean uh, 12 months or more. Uh, when it's like a few months out, then I consider that like medium term. Uh, if you are holding a losing call position, would you ever turn that into a spread? A question by Paper Trader 101. Uh, what are the pros and cons of doing so? So here's the thing with holding a losing call position. If it's already negative, and then you convert that into a spread by, say, selling a higher strike, uh, a lot of times that you'll find that that basically means that you are limiting your loss. But basically, your gains are now pretty much it's pretty much a losing position because uh, you probably say say for example, um, let's just try to use this calculator to show an example bold call spread. Just use Ebon here for example. Say that you bought Ebon ten C for three nineteen at three sixty, and then say the stock price uh, or the asset price you know goes down to you know eight. Or nine dollars. So now this play is losing. So let's say that instead of three sixty is now two sixty, and say that this is this was two eighty before, and so now it's probably even less. So let's say it's um, two dollars or something, or or a dollar sixty. So by selling this this uh, further out strike and converting it into spread, you are basically limiting yourself to a max additional gain. Your your max width is two fifty, right? So twelve fifty minus ten dollars. So your max um, value of your spread is two hundred fifty dollars. But you bought this at three sixty. It's now two sixty. That means you already lost a hundred dollars in a play. And then now you're selling this at say two dollars. So you you get back two hundred dollars. So that means that you you paid a dollar sixty for this spread. So you paid a hundred sixty dollars to make two hundred fifty dollars, which is not a very good risk. Risk, you know, like it's not a good ratio, risk reward ratio, um, because you, you're basically paying a lot for for a not so great spread. Uh, so we see here, currently the spread would only be worth say eighty dollars. So you're paying double what other people are currently pay paying for that same play, and even if the play goes back green. You're only going to gain ninety dollars. So in that case, uh, if you are still actually bullish on Ivan, what you sh what I would do is I would just hold the calls and and let it ride out and see if we you know get that pick up again in price. If uh, you are bearish on Ivan, then you know you just close the position, right? There's there's no reason to hold the call if you're bearish on it. No reason. Uh, if you're bearish on it, just close it. If you think that there's, you know, it can still go up or it's holding support well here, then you know, just consider holding those naked, um, not naked calls, but consider holding, continue holding those long calls, and uh, wait for a chance to regain that value. Because if you do this instead and convert it into a spread, you are severely limiting your upside, and you're basically quote unquote locking in your losses. That's not something I, I, I mean, it's fine. "Quote unquote locking in your losses," but at that point, I would just rather just sell sell this um, call instead. This is just my personal opinion, but yeah. Hope that answers your question. All right, uh, I think I'm really really behind on on the chat here, so I'm trying to quickly scroll through it as quick as I can. Uh, Lord Ant, yes, uh, cover calls are only for when you own 100 shares of a stock because uh, an option contract is the right. You're buying the right to buy 100 shares of that contract at the strike price that you bought the call at. That means that if you're selling those calls, you're selling that right to somebody else who now has the right to basically buy your shares at that price, 100 shares. And that's why options are essentially leveraged because it's times 100, right? You get a lot more movement out of it than you would from owning shares of the stock. Um, yep. So I think some people already answered that question, actually. All right. I am all caught up with chat now. Uh, any more questions? Otherwise, I am going to 
need to uh, prep for another meeting I have in, in an hour. I actually have a lot of material I need to study before that meeting. So I uh, hope this stream was helpful for you all. Thanks again for tuning in to Xtrade's uh, seminar. We will be doing this again every two weeks. I'll be going over new strategies, how I use them, and then we'll have a short Q&A with some practical applications in the end, just like today. I, I hope this session you found helpful. This session will be kept up on the Twitch uh, channel for about two weeks, so you can feel free to um, check that out again if you need to review something. I will be posting the slides up on our Xtrace Discord server as well as the YouTube uh, link for our previous session on ER calendar spreads. So check that out if you uh, haven't already or you want a uh, refresher on that. And, um, you know, thanks again for, for joining. If you haven't joined our Xtrades server yet, please do so. Also, uh, you know, if you guys need a broker for options that is really good, you can try out Tastyworks. And again, uh, these are just referral links I'm putting out here. But um, if, if anyone, you know, signs up with those, that little bit helps me a lot, so I appreciate it. Uh, but, you know, that'll be all for today. Thanks again for joining, and peace out. Ah uh, yeah. Uh, about the question on the on the crypto server. Yep, we we do have uh, a crypto server as well as called Crypto Traders, and it is associated with X Trades. Uh, pretty much run by by the same folks, you know. And I'm on there as well. Um, I do have you know about five years of experience in crypto. Uh, not quite as much as uh, just the general stock market. But yeah, if you guys need a exchange to join. Definitely check out that KuCoin uh, referral link I put up above. That would help me out a lot. Uh, and I, I appreciate any referrals I can get. It's quick and easy to, to register with them. Doesn't, um, doesn't require any like verification or KYC like a bunch of other exchanges do. You can instantly sign up and you start trading pretty much within you know, five minutes, 10 minutes or whatever. Uh, but yeah, they do. You can, use, you can even use credit card to purchase crypto on there. I don't really recommend using credit card to purchase crypto. Um, it is an option. Uh, you know, just just use a regular um, like cash that you actually own is what I recommend. Uh, and that's true for any trade. Don't over leverage yourself. Don't trade on margin. Don't you know? Don't trade on credit or uh, advance credit or anything like that, please. Uh, for terminology, the question from Paper Trader One Hundred One on the terminology for uh, what was it on different brokers? Usually, brokers uh, have a help or support section that actually talk about all the terminology. But if you do need additional help, you know, just check us out on X Trades Discord server, and we can answer your questions there on any specific questions you might have about uh, a particular broker or just in general options terminology or even uh, stock terminology because we do do stocks as well as options i mostly focus on the options aspect uh, as this is in options seminar so again uh, thanks